South Hunting Podcast, presented by the Onyx Hunt app. This is Mike Higman, and I am really excited about this episode. I had the privilege to talk to Dr. Grant Woods of Growing Deer TV, and uh, we got in some really cool stuff. We talked about, uh, first of all, we touched on the Deer Movement podcast that we did last year. And if you didn't get a chance to listen to those, that's from September 18th was the first episode. It was episodes 51, 52, and 53. And uh, if you hadn't had a chance, I would go back and give those a listen. Although you could go ahead and listen to this first. It's not really going to spoil those for you. But we got Dr. Wood's opinion on those things. And then we covered a whole wide range of topics. We covered CWD. Um, we talked about predator control. We talked about the declining turkey populations. We talked about the effect of baiting. And we also, he, you know, he gave us some great tips on, on hunting strategies as well. So uh, I hope your turkey season went better than mine. It's, it's all wrapped up for me here. And I know across the South, it's, it's closing up. And I hope, hope you guys had a better season than I did. But I am really excited to be getting back into deer hunting mode and you know, starting to put trail cameras out and do that kind of stuff. So we're also going to be moving that direction with the podcast as well. Just a quick reminder, if you're from Florida, the public land permit application period just opened up and it's going to be open through the middle of next month. And I'm sure if you're from other states, it's probably pretty similar timing. So just don't forget to sign up for those. I've had a few people from Florida here reach out to me and ask if I could do an episode on, you know, how to do that or just different things with that. And I really want to keep this open to the whole Southeast. So if you're one of those people that need some help with it or you're new to it, just reach out to me on social media. I'd love to help you out. There's a few things that I wish I knew the first couple times I applied. So if you've got any questions with it or anything, or you just want to talk strategy or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. Grant had so much good information to share. This this interview went kind of long. So we're going to go ahead and skip the five questions from the QDMA conference last year for this episode. And I'm going to try to keep it nice and tight for you guys here. But I do want to remind you real quick, huntinggeardeals.com. You should be signed up for that email list. We've got Memorial Day coming up, and there's going to be a lot of really good sales going on for that. And if you sign up for that email list, it's going to show up in your inbox every day. If you see something you like, and click on the link. If not, just delete the email. And also, we've been doing a lot of gear reviews for that gear review program as well. We just posted a really cool review on the BioLite Fire Pit, which is like a a self-contained little fire pit with a fan in it. Uh, You'll have to check it out if if you're interested. Something that could work like on a back deck or if you're out on a camping trick or or something like that, especially if you're in an area where you're not allowed to have like open fires on the ground, that thing would come in really handy. Um, There's a bunch of other great gear reviews too, and we have a bunch coming up. If you haven't, go ahead and apply for the program if you're interested in writing for us. So let's go ahead and do this interview. I'm really excited for you all to hear it. I'm really excited that we have got Dr. Grant Woods on with us today. Uh, if if you're not familiar with him, I'd be really surprised to hear that. But I've gotten lots of requests for him. And uh, he's going to come on and talk to us about the deer movement study that we did, or not the study, but the the podcast covering it last fall. Uh but what's so great about Grant is that uh, he's a wildlife biologist, but not only that, he works full time on his own property, creating deer content. And then on top of that, so you're not just dealing with one property as he does consulting across the country. Uh, so he's he's an awesome source for deer information and deer biology. He's the uh, the host and producer of GrowingDeer.tv. Uh, welcome to the show, Grant. Thanks for having me, Mike. So... um. We actually met in person at the ATA this year. Uh, there was a uh, a group about uh, CWD and kind of covering uh, the challenges and and what we're going to do going forward. And it was just kind of like a, a discussion panel. You were one of the the panel members, and uh, I came up to talk to you afterwards. And I wanted to approach you about discussing this D- GPS deer movement study series of podcasts we did last year. And um, mm-hmm. I was. I was going to just try to beg you to please listen to them so that we could discuss them. And I was so excited that you had told me that you'd already heard them. It was like such an honor to me that you had actually listened to them and were familiar with them. Um, and uh, anyway, that made my day. And I was really excited to try to bring you on so we could kind of, I want to get your opinion on it because um, we'll, we'll touch on this. But what I kept thinking through the whole thing is, you know, I've followed you probably since, you know, since I got serious about hunting. And I just kept thinking back to, I always remember you saying, 
that think about a deer putting on their winter coat and walking around in the middle of the day when it's hot. And that just makes so much sense to me. Um, but then I hear these GPS studies and, um, you know, they're kind of saying otherwise. So I really wanted to get your opinion because you're, you you kind of have a, a foot on both sides of the fence on the biology side and then actually on the hunting side. And I know, you know, a lot of the guests that we had on, um, so I, I'm going to kind of leave it a little bit open-ended. I just kind of want to get your initial thoughts on on which way to go with that. Man, I appreciate the opportunity. And of course I listen to your stuff. You usually have great stuff. Well, I appreciate um, that. So, yeah, so I ha- I am. I'm, I'm a hunter. Man, I, I'm probably more alive when I'm hunting. I'm being a predator. I'm, I'm in that mode, if you will, than at any time in my life. And I'm a biologist. I've put collars on deer. I've darted deer, rocket netted deer, done despicable things to deer for research and followed that data. So I do have a, a foot on both sides of that fence and hopefully might be able to bring a little clarity, clarity to it. So GPSs, as they've advanced and become less expensive or, or omnipresent, they're used by many, many researchers. And just to give us an example of a few things in the past, uh, many people, myself included, thought, boy, this moon phase thing, it's got something going on, man. We need to need to do it. And I myself even sold a moon calendar. I did it with deer and deer hunting way, way back in the day. This is 20 plus years ago. And I'd done a bunch of statistical work using regression, a bunch of big stuff on observations, what hunters saw. And put together, and we published this. We were about 68 to 70 percent accurate on our predictability. I think that's pretty good, man. I mean, two out of three in hunting is awesome. That's a lot better than 50, uh, right? And, uh, well, or better than my normal 10 percent, right? So, <laughs> uh, and and I was a graduate student and making a little bit of change off this project. So I was helping hunters, I thought, and making a little money. I mean, that's like you know really good. And then. I was blessed enough to be on a little project in Alabama, man. We scratched up some money and got a few collars and put on deer. And what this collar data showed me, and remember a GPS, it's, I think there's a lot of misconceptions. The really expensive ones may give you live data, but most of them store the data on memory on the collar. And the collar is retrieved from the deer. And most of them will release at a preset date. So you say, well, I'm going to go through the rut. And I want this thing to fall off the deer March 1st or whatever. And you go out in the field and find where the collar fell off by a signal. You walk out there and find it by a signal. So anyway, uh, got the data, started plugging it in the computer. I mean, it's like Christmas or checking your trap line in the morning. You can't wait to see what it is. And it was nothing like what I was expecting and found out I was wrong and quit publishing that calendar. I gave up that source of revenue because what the caller showed me and what I thought I knew based on what I was seeing was wrong. Take that you know, decades in the future, the collars are much better, more accurate. Most of them are, you know, and there's a lot of variables, battery size, like saying, most of them are accurate to about 10 feet or 15 feet. That's really doggone accurate for where deer is when you're talking about talking to a satellite. And and they're getting data 24 hours a day. You program it, take a reading every 15 minutes or every hour or once a day, depending on your study, just explaining to the audience the basis of all this data. And so 14 other researchers and myself pulled together thousands of data we collected from fetuses. When deer were bred, you measured a fetus, almost like our wives going to the doctor and having an ultrasound, and they measure crown to rump, top of the head to the bottom, and pretty much for humans predict when a baby's going to be born. But for deer, we backdated. We went back to when conception occurred and found out, I'm going to make a lot of people mad right here, there is no relationship between phase of the moon, distance of the moon from the surface of the earth, declination, degrees north and south of the equator, and when deer breed, period. You're not going to predict the rut based on the moon, folks. It will not happen, period. So data can really help hunters. On this deer movement and GPS side, and by the way, that sample size was over 10,000. It was, and it was from like 13 different states. It wasn't just one little place. Wow. So don't believe in the uh, folks, it's it's not going to work. Do not believe it. Um, and take that to one guy who kills the biggest buck, either on the dark of the moon or the full moon or whatever, and you're never going to change his mind. To put that in scale, I remember many years ago an article in a popular magazine, a guy killed, I don't remember it, I mean, you know, 200 plus inches, this whopper buck, back when that was really rare. 
about 50 yards from an interstate. And he published a big article and he said, big bucks hide by interstates because no one wants to hunt there because it's too loud. <laughs> and then you envision all these guys with a rifle 50 yards off an interstate hunting throughout America. That was one deer, one time, one guy. Be careful where you get your data. So all your guests had really good data, the, the science guests, really good data. And, and I'm not denying anything they say. And me as a hunter, or and, and Mark Drury and I are close friends. Uh, Mark is a great hunter. And when, man, when Mark says, man, there's a cold front coming in, I'm going out here and I saw 100 deer in the field. Or, boy, it's 10 degrees warmer than normal, and, and I didn't see anything tonight from my stand. I absolutely believe that. Yeah. No doubt. Fine. So how can the two be saying the same thing but a different way? How can the hunt, the deer, the deer ball just be saying deer move no matter what, and the hunter saying, boy, some days are gold, and some days I should have stayed home and sharpened some broadheads or something? How can that be? And, and this is theory. Please hear me clearly. This is theory. I have not specifically done a research project to prove this, but it's based on a lot of years. You know, I'm kind of getting long in the tooth. It's a lot of years of being a hunter and a researcher and a guy that's put GPS collars on deer and analyzed the data. They're not looking at the same thing. Are deer moving during what seems to be, you know, bad conditions? It's November. And, and by the way, folks, I don't ever look at the actual temperature. I look at the percent change it is from normal for that day. So if it's, let's just say, supposed to be 50 and it's 60, that's bad. Is 60 bad? No, 60 would be awesome September 1st. It's the difference it is for normal that day because deer bodies, their metabolism, the length of their hair, their thermal regulatory properties are dependent upon day length and that season of year. So, for example, again, it's, man, it's the rut in southern Missouri where I live, and it should be in the 30s in the morning, maybe warm up to 40 or 50, and it's 70. I'm probably not going to see a lot of deer where I normally hunt. But the question is, are deer still moving? And the GPS callers have told us yes. So here's the situation. Hunters are probably as conditioned as deer. They tend to do the same thing over and over and over. And they do it based on averages. Okay, in November, it's going to be cooler. The rut's on in most places. I'm going to hunt open bedding areas or travel corridors or whatever your strategy is. And those areas don't work when it's 10, 20, 30% warmer than normal. Are the deer still moving? Yes. But they're probably moving in the shade on a north slope or a dense creek bottom somewhere where it's cooler. Like we go in and turn the air conditioning on it or we take an extra layer off or two or three extra layers off. Deer cannot do that. So they have to use a different part of their habitat or it's way colder than normal. Doggone it. We're going to go in and turn the heater on or put some more layers on or put the, you know, the battery powered vest on to stay warm. And the deer are going to go on a South facing slope out of the wind and in the sun. So mm -hmm. it is my belief that both sets of your guest were correct. <clears throat> I know Mark well, and he is a very good hunter. I'm not going to disagree with Mark about deer observation. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I know I know some of the scientists you interviewed, and they are top-shelf scientists. They're not going to fudge. Dwayne, Dwayne out of Pennsylvania isn't really a big deer hunter. He is a great scientist. He has no reason to fudge the numbers. He's not taking money from any hunting company. He's He's just a scientist, and I'm not going to doubt Dwayne's work. Right. I'm just not. I know, I know Dwayne personally. He is a good scientist. Um, but they're saying the same thing, but looking at it from different ways. So I do believe deer are still moving. On the worst days, people still kill some deer. There's not a day in Pennsylvania or Missouri's or anyone else's gun season that somebody doesn't tag a deer. That never happens. We get upset when the harvest is down 10%. 10% isn't much. But if you're one of the 10% that didn't kill a deer that season, you're going, boy, this is the worst season I've ever had. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think we all got to back up a little bit, kind of put our reality hat on and realize that we tend to do the same thing. I, I'm a consultant. I work properties all the time. And I, I'm a, I, I go to properties when the hunter path to the blind or stand is more worn than the deer trail they're hunting. 
Literally, they go there to that specific location more than deer use the area they're watching. That's a really bad recipe. Yeah. Really bad recipe. Uh, Deer, again, they cannot control their environment like humans do, either by their dress or their housing. So they have to use different parts of their environment for the conditions that day. I'll take this one step further, and I know I've went on about this a good bit. That's why you're on. I, keep I, going. <laughs> I often hear people talk about a bedding area or a deer bed. Well, that old buck, he's bedding on the point of that ridge, and he's going to come off here. And that may be true a small percent or even half the time or whatever. But remember, deer can they're not like humans. We think about deer like humans. The biggest error I see hunters make, speaking as from a scientist, the biggest mistake I see hunters make, and I work from New Zealand to Canada with white-tailed deer folks, not in two or three states, literally. Biggest mistake I see hunters make is hunting deer and thinking about them in human terms. Nothing can be further from the truth. We're wimps. Deer are incredible survivors. Incredible. I never want deer to get wise and try to take over the world because they will win. <laughs> Just under survival skills. Not, not, they're not necessarily smart but their instinct is incredible. So deer may bed three or four different places during a day. When it's really cold, man, they're out of the wind, or if the sun, if it's not nighttime, if it's sunny, they're going to be on that south-facing slope or on flat land. And, you know, I lived in South Carolina for South Carolina and Georgia for years. I went to University of Georgia in Clemson. My wife, Trace, and I stayed in the south for, I don't know, eight or ten years after I got out of college and hunted and still worked projects all over that area. And man, on a cold day, I got to tell you, 30 degrees in Charleston, South Carolina feels wicked cold because of that really high humidity. Wicked cold. And on those days, deer laying out in a pretty new clear cut where they can get total sunshine and there's just enough brush to keep the wind off of them and the sun's radiant energy, which is the source of energy for all of life on this planet, is, is hitting their body. They want to be out of wind and in the sun. And, and 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 then that changes as the day warms up, and they're going, just like us, gosh, it's getting hot, and we're going to take a coat off or a layer off, deer moving more in the shade. So it's not, boy, here's a deer bed. It's what are the conditions at that moment? Where do I need to be hunting at that moment? And that's why I have a seminar, actually, I give time to time. My seminars change every year. It's not like I got one in a can I pulled out. I'm learning more. I'm changing. I'm seeing new pictures, whatever. I have a seminar I call Hunting Like a Bobcat. Most humans hunt like a coyote, but we don't have the skills of a coyote. They move fast and try to cover a lot of ground. Coyotes do the same thing, but they got a nose about four inches long and millions more nasal receptors, and they're hunting by scent. We're hunting by sight. So we hunt like a coyote, but don't have the same tool set. We need to hunt like a bobcat. They got a little bitty old puny nose, even though it's got more receptors than we have. We got a little bitty old puny nose. The coyotes got tremendous endurance, and I get out of breath going uphill 100 yards. Bobcats move really slow, and and they do this. When you put a GPS collar on a bobcat, they may hunt this area today, over the ridge tomorrow, down the valley the next day. They kind of got these big old patterns, so they don't wear the deer out. You never find a bobcat trail. They're not hunting the same place over and over, because if they did, the prey would condition to avoiding them. They're stalking through the brush. How many times have you been turkey calling and, and you don't even know it and the bobcat gets in there 30, 40 yards close to you before you see him because he's moving so slow. And hunters go through the woods like they're you know late for lunch. <laughs> so if we would hunt like a bobcat and, and learn a lot from bobcats or mountain lions, we strike at close range. Bobcats strike at close range. We sit and watch prey. We're more efficient sitting and watching prey. Bobcats are very efficient. They're they're moving to their area, and then they're just basically setting or stalking really, really slow. Just just move, set, move, set, move, set, move, set, move, set. An incredible, efficient way to kill deer. Very efficient. Like mountain lions are the ultimate deer predator. So bottom line, I'm off on a, off on a tangent here, but I think both groups were right. I'm not being a wimp. I'm very outspoken. Uh, I think they were looking at it through different lenses. The scientists are going, I don't know what's wrong with you hunters. Gosh, I've got thousands and thousands of data points. And more or less deer moving, they move in the morning, they move in the evening, 
They don't move as much in the midday except during the rut. And by the way, you ever wonder why deer move the most at sunrise and sunset? I mean, they clearly do. From studies from when I was in graduate school till now, the peaks are at sunrise and sunset, you know, a couple hour period in there. Right. There's a really easy explanation for that. There's a really easy one, a really easy one. So at sunrise or sunset, the sun is increasing at sunrise, and we're going from a really cold surface area, or at least cooler. It almost rarely does it get colder, right? As at nine o'clock, it's not nine o'clock in the morning. It's not getting colder. It's right. getting warmer. There's the uh, there's the odd storm, folks. I don't want a bunch of hate mail. Yes, I know <laughs> there's the odd storm every. But in general, okay, well, that means the thermals must change. Cold air sinks, warm air rises. It's like Newton's law number three. And hunters ignore this all the time. So at that time of day, on flat land, it's shifting to some creek or something like that. In the hill country where I live, it, the thermals are stronger than winds usually. And they will go up or down based on their warmer cold. And they can be doing both. They can be going up on the sunny side and down 10 feet away on the cool side. And as a matter of fact, and I'm not touting our own work, but I happened to be working in New York last week with a landowner. His father was with us, and he smoked a great big old stogie. And we're walking through the woods. I'm watching the guy cigar smoke all day. I'm staying close to it, actually. Not that I like cigar smoke because the bugs are really bad. I'm trying to be in the smoke so the bugs aren't bad. <laughs> If you've ever worked in New York, you know how bad flies can be this time of year. I mean, they're horrible. And so I noticed I kept changing sides of the guy because the wind was swirling. I'm talking within a few yards, not, you know, a quarter mile away. And so I'm noticing it, and I don't see anyone notice anything. So we go to this little bitty creek bottom as we're working the property, walking, learning the property, developing a habitat plan. We're working the property, and there's a creek that's really cold, like a little trout stream. And where the creek crosses the road is maybe... I don't know, eight or 10 feet lower than the rest of the road in general. And when we go through the first time, the guy's smoke, this is midday, like two in the afternoon. The smoke from the cigar is going uphill until we get right in the creek bottom. And it's strongly, much stronger, much faster. It goes downhill because cold air seeks the lowest place. It's heavy like water. It seeks the lowest place and rushes downhill. And right in that creek bottom was cold and, and it's just rushing downhill. And three steps up on the other side, it goes back uphill. I'm talking within a few yards. There's yeah. no chance for a hunter to sit there and not and get in bow range of a deer because the wind's swirling all the time. In midday, the wind's more consistent. And middle of night, it's more consistent. So deer move, I, I believe, thoroughly. I can't ask them. I can't knock on, hey, hey, Booner, when do you like to move <laughs> most and why? No one can do that. But we know from observations and GPS callers, the peaks of deer movement throughout the year are you know, sunrise and sunset, a couple hours either way. And that's when the thermals are churning the most. Is it warm? Is it cold? It's warm here, cold here, it's swirling up and down. And deer basically have 360 degree protection by their nose. That's the safest time for them to move. And by the way, their nose is not their number one predator defense mechanism. It is not their nose. It is not their eye. It is not their ears. I'm making a lot of people mad today. <laughs> it, is, it is none of those. It is their stomach. They were designed, they were created, if you will, to have this great big stomach, unlike us. Well, I got a pretty big stomach, but most people don't. <laughs> and, they, and deer go out into the open. They go to the open because that's where the sun hits the ground, and that's where the most growth and energy-rich food is going to be called early succession growth. So they go out in the open, and man, they eat like my kids. They just cram it in as fast as they can. They ingest it. They don't digest it. They ingest it. And they spend the least amount of time out in the open as they can. And then they go back in the bushes because the saber-toothed tiger, i.e. the predator, can get them. They're more exposed to damage out in the open than they are in cover, right? We like the hunt openings. And they go back in cover, and then they regurgitate it, chew it up a little bit more, put it back down in the rumen, a four-chambered stomach, not four stomachs, a stomach with four chambers, and let the bacteria in their gut digest it. If they're like us and they had to eat and digest at the same time, they had a big, great big old five-gallon bucket holding capacity in their belly, they'd be going out in the open all the time, feeding more frequently, and they'd be much more vulnerable to predation. So a deer stomach keeps them from being out in the open 
versus a horse or a cow. Cows have a rumen, but it's not quite the same design that's eating all day long. And cows, by the way, are not afraid of predation. Most of them are not. Yeah. Deer are very afraid of predation. So they go out in the open, they get the food, and they go back in the cover. How can we use that knowledge as hunters? How can we use that knowledge to make deer move more? Gosh, that's a new strategy. How can we use this knowledge to make deer move more? Well, the better quality food, let's just take forage soybeans as an example, better quality food, lush, tender vegetation, whatever you're planting, digest quicker. I was just working last week in northern Minnesota. By the way, it was cold enough there. When I say northern, the Mississippi River was there. It's about 20 yards wide. That's how far north I was. And, and, and on this property, there were very few food plots, just solid timber all around, timber, 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 and deer were eating sticks, alder twigs and, and aspen twigs. Those digest really slowly. Think about you chewing on a toothpick versus chewing on a little piece of lettuce. The lettuce digests much quicker, right? Breaks down, digests much quicker mm-hmm. versus a toothpick. Deer that eat really high quality forage, like in Southern Iowa, where a lot of people have shows based out of, there's a reason all the shows are based out of Southern Iowa. Right. Um, several reasons. When you're they're, eating on not soybeans. not all in Southern Missouri? If, no, no. <laughs> only, only fools try to make a show in Southern Missouri, I promise. Yeah. When deer eat on soybeans all day, that digests really quickly. So they have to feed. They have more feeding bouts, literally. This has been shown in Illinois by GPS callers. They have more feeding bouts per day, and more food is going through their gut, so more minerals and protein is staying in their body, and they get bigger. Because more is going through, they're keeping good stuff out of a higher volume, and they get bigger. You want to have better hunting on your property. People ask me all the time, how can I get deer to move more on my place? Well, you can use dogs to chase them, or you can have really high-quality food so it digests much quicker, and they have to have more feeding bouts per day. When deer are eating sawdust for a living, i.e. sticks and twigs, it takes a long time to be digested in their gut, and they don't feel empty very frequently, so they don't get up and move as much. That's really interesting. I've, I've never never heard that explained that way, yeah, but it, may, it does get, make sense. Yeah, I'll get a bunch of hate mail because a lot of people haven't heard it, and of course, if you haven't heard it, it can't not be true, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just what humans are. There's no way that can be true. I don't know why those guys are killing all those deer out in the Midwest, but it can't be because of that. Yeah. Well, well, going back to both sides being right. I mean, at the end of the whole, we know we talked to all these different biologists when, when, when I asked them at the end, most of them admitted at the end, well, yeah, I'm going to, you know, if it's a a nice cold front day, I'm going to be a lot more likely to go hunting and I'm going to expect to see more deer, despite the fact that they're looking at the data that may say otherwise. So that really does go along a lot with what you're saying. Yeah, but they're hunting in their normal places, and, and no one says, well, I'm going to go make a stand for an 80-degree mosquito day. Right. No one does that. We hang our stands, set our blinds for really good hunting conditions. That's our vision. It's going to be, when I get to go hunting, the conditions are going to be good, so I'm placing my blinds or stands X. And and the spot and stock hunters, I'm talking whitetail, not western game, the eastern Spot and stock hunters I know are some of the most successful hunters and are very skilled woodsmen. Mm-hmm. And they don't care the conditions. They don't care the conditions because they know under these conditions, deer are likely to be in X habitat. So that's where they're going to hunt. They're like the bobcat. In these conditions, I need to be hunting here. And if your guide only has two or three stands or blinds, I'm going to bet every one of them is set for that, you know, frosty morning northwest wind whatever day and you get the curveball you get the southeast wind on the back side of the front and it's 10 degrees or i don't really like 10 degrees i like 10 percent. so you know the difference between 30 and 40 and 70 and 80 well the difference between 70 and 80 just isn't much mm-hmm. but the difference between 30 and 40 is a bunch it's actually 25 percent. it's a bunch 70 and 80 is just not much difference so i always talk in in is it warmer or colder than normal in percent. And if it's 10% warmer or colder than normal or more, that's a good day to hunt. If it's 10% colder than normal and it's been warm, that's a great day to hunt because the deer are likely moving where I've set my stands. It's not the deer moving more, they're moving where I set my stands. And the opposite's true. I mean, you're in January and it's been blistering cold like it was this last year, and you get a little warm up then deer are probably moving in their normal areas. 
But when it's 10% colder than normal, they're moving somewhere where the environmental conditions are such to stay warm. And I do know you've got stands specifically set up for like south facing slopes or those real cold days in, in some of those areas where you've done habitat, you know, TSI type stuff and, and clearing a lot of things out. So you have open sunlight coming down. Is that um, something that you focused on for those real cold days? It is. It is. So, so it, I like hunting like a bobcat. I'm not the most skilled woodsman. I have success at it. But I have, you know, I have a lot of guests here and stuff like that. So we know that really candidly, we make a show every week, 52 weeks out of the year, we release a new show. We can't say, well, folks, we don't have any show this week because it's <laughs> 10% warmer than normal and we couldn't see any deer. That doesn't work in my business. And I enjoy hunting and we eat about 20 does a year. My family eats a lot of venison. So I have stand set for all conditions. And this is something I tell people all the time. It's like trapping coyotes. If you're a coyote trapper, and you find a good place, maybe a signpost or a scent station or whatever, you don't put one trap there. You put three traps there. So if I've got a little hidey old food plot, and maybe it's only 50 yards across, I rarely have one or one stand or blind there. I want to be able to hunt that on different conditions. So if it's good enough for one blind or stand, if an area, whether it's a travel corridor, food plot, bedding area, is good enough for one stand or blind, it's probably good enough for two or three. So different wind conditions, you can still hunt the same area. And, and that's something I see. I always, almost, almost always see one stand or one blind for setup everywhere I go. And that right. means, well, I can only hunt. And they're always set up for a west or northwest wind. No one really says, well, it's going to be an east wind because that's a, east winds only come on the backside of a front in, in North America. So unless you live right by the coast. Okay. And so yeah. no one goes, well, you know, no one goes, well, guys, I'm only going to have an east wind about 10% of the time, but I'm going to hang 25% of my stands for an east wind. No one does that. But what happens if you have that year where three Saturdays in a row it's an east wind? Mm -hmm. You're either spooking deer or you're not hunting. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we, we set stands and blinds for all conditions, warm, cold, every wind direction. I think that actually goes back to what you were saying believe. earlier, too, with – guys wearing out a trail that are stand you know you've got a limited area to hunt but if you're not hunting the exact same spot that you know the deer have less opportunity to know exactly where you're going to be sitting and and just as importantly if not more you're not approaching the same way and you're not exiting the same way mm -hmm. you know because deer do have memory this has been shown by my my good friend and awesome deer researcher dr carl miller deer have memory i won't go into all the details of his research so I love this statement. People say, man, I'm going to scout today because it's going to rain tonight. I'm like, does the rain wash the memory of a deer's brain? <laughs> if you're out there scouting and walking all over and you leave scent trails everywhere or you physically bust some deer or whatever, do you think the rain made them forget that? Nope. It's just a little bit deeper level of thinking to be a really, really good deer predator. So I, I scout and I do scout during season. But I'm very cautious. I'm waiting for the right wind direction. I do use scent control. Man, I'm treating my boots, my clothes. I, I use scent, scent crusher. Uh, I scout in the same condition I would go hunting. I do not want to condition deer to avoiding the area. Or this one drives me nuts. People putting trail cameras at the base of a tree stand. Because hmm. if you got a trail camera, unless it's a cell signal based trail camera, you're going in there to check it, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're your condition, and you're going in daytime, you're probably not going in at night. You're conditioning deer to avoid the area during daylight by checking your trail camera. Mm -hmm. So I put my trail cameras, most of them, where I can reach them off a UTV or a pickup or, or big fields where I'm probably not bow hunting anyway. And I say, okay, these deer are in the area, and he enters the field from this side. He's probably bedding over here, or he's coming from this direction. And then I go put my stand where there's no camera, where there's no disturbance. I, I liken it like this. I, mean, I, I personally, as a contractor, I do some work for the military on military bases. Most Department of Defense bases have to have a wildlife component or a habitat component because they own a lot of land. So I've been blessed enough to work on a few of those contracts. And I believe the Navy SEALs are the greatest warriors on the planet, period, bar none. And the SEALs, just being really candid here, I mean, they're safe as they can be at their base. I mean, there's ground sensors, and now I'm going all detail, blah, blah, blah. You, you just almost can't get there. But when they're out on maneuvers, they're in danger. It takes extreme skill to return to base alive. Mm -hmm. 
that's like a, that's like a mature buck. When he's in a area that's favorable for him to bed, the wind is swirling, he's on the side of a mountain, the wind is swirling, blah, blah, blah. A hunter can, a bow hunter especially, almost cannot get to him. But when he's on maneuvers, he's going from bedding to food or bedding to chase does or bedding to whatever, that's when he's most vulnerable. And, and that's where I try to, to capitalize on their movements, not necessarily at their destination, they often don't get to their destination. If, if their destination is a wide open field, and people kill bucks in wide open fields all the time, but that's a very low pressured property or an odd event. My property gets hunted a lot. So most of the mature bucks we kill are in the timber or crossing the power line or somewhere where we get a sneak peek into their life. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of hunting pressure on my property. And, and the research is super clear that deer react negatively or go undercover with hunting pressure. Very clear. Yep. Uh, so going to the trail cameras real quick. So I know you use a lot of Reconyx cameras, and I know because of doing a weekly show, you're kind of, you you need to take that information quickly sometimes. But do you have any camera setups where you might not even check it for a season and you, you're using that data for future season so you're not like so let's say you put it like in an area where you know there's likely bedding and you don't want to be going in and out of there to check that um is that something where you might leave it out for the full season and check it back for grab information for future seasons rarely because my hunting strategy is based on knowing what deer in the area and not trying to pinpoint exactly where they are with a trail camera okay my right. hunting strategy is is knowing what deer, what bucks, or age class, whatever, how many does, I use this for does too, are in the area. And then I somehow think I'm a good enough woodsman to know, okay, they need food, cover, water, this is the sources at that day, that week, you know, are acorns on the ground, are they really hitting the forage soybeans, or, you know, they prefer white oaks versus red oaks this week, whatever it is, and positioning myself in there. So, but to your point, I think, Show cameras, a lot of, I think a lot of people misuse them. They use them to predict the future, and doing that needs to be last year's pictures. The data you get are good from that day and backwards, not the future. Right. Because most deer, especially in tumor country, the, the, the tougher the habitat, the tougher it is to pattern deer. If you're in really great quality habitat, I mean, it's food cover, food cover, and the food outweighs cover. You're in basically ag country, and there's a 100 acre bean field or cornfield or whatever, and a 40 yard wide strip by a creek, and then another field or pasture on the other side, you know where the deer are going to be traveling. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love, I love to hunt Western Kansas. Typically, if I get a tag in Western Kansas, public land, I've done it both public land, private land. I'll study the maps before I go there. I'll spend my first day or two of the hunt with binoculars way back, just watching pinch points and travel places. And by third or fourth day, I've stuck an arrow on a mature deer. Uh, it's so easy to pattern deer in those areas. Right. I feel sorry for the. Old, I feel sorry for my fellow hunters in Alabama and you know all up and down the Smoky Mountains and they're watching these TV shows where guys are slamming down monster bucks and you go, man, I'm not much of a hunter, man. I these guys <laughs> are killing a big buck every week and I haven't seen one in two years. There's no comparison. I, I, I always remember when I was in South Carolina, a couple of my buddies that worked for the state of Georgia, man, they saved their pennies up and they got to go on antelope hunt. And I mean, this was big time stuff, you know, and they're, they get in their truck and they got their food and everything. It's a low budget hunt and they get out there and, and they see these antelopes way out there. And there's a creek that kind of goes from where the truck's parked, almost to where the antelopes are. So they're getting ready. They're getting their gear ready and they're going to get in that creek bank and walk up through there and try to snipe those goats from, you know, right off the top of the creek bank and a local hunter old timer comes by and says what you boys doing so man we're going to get in this creek bank and you know crawl up through there with our bows and try to get up there close and see if we can't snipe those goats and the the guy says man you can't that's a waste of time son you can have a blind on the water hole that's a total waste of time so well you know we're from south carolina and heck we're just going to give it a try just you know it's a fun hunt so Guy sets in truck laughing at him and they get in the ditch and they belly crawl up through there and at the right moment they pop up and kill both the goats (laughs) <laughs> come back dragging through the truck and the guy says i've never seen anything like that in my life well that guy lives with his goats all the time he didn't have to hunt hard he knows what water holes are going to these are south carolina or i think they were georgia boys they hunt in the mountains of georgia deer don't do any pattern they just figure out how to kill them yeah and that's what they did with the goats 
And you take an old boy that's killing 130 inch deer regularly in the swamps or in the mountains and put him in ag country, he will be a rock star. I promise you, he will be a rock star. He'll figure out the game quickly and he will be a rock star hunter. There's that big a difference. Well, I think there's just such a difference when you, uh, it's a lot of these like TV shows and that kind of stuff. What they're saying is making sense and funnels and that kind of stuff. And I think those type of things exist to some extent, you know, in, in the South, but in those parts of the country, it's like so exaggerated, you know, the, um, you know, you know the field edges, well, there's only so much area for the deer to be in. Um, even, even not ag country. Um, I've been in areas of Wisconsin when there's marshes and stuff. Well, these little islands are the only places they can be, um, versus, you know, thousands of acres of pine trees. Yeah. I love hunting ag country and there's some great, great hunters in ag country, but I got to tell you, uh, we need to share content and tips and, and yes, bottlenecks work no matter where they are. Here where I live, I live in the Ozark Mountains. We use steep bluffs or really steep slopes or creeks or whatever as our bottleneck, but they're a lot tougher to find and they're not as predictable as you've got a 200 acre bean field and a 40 yard wide strip of woods. They're just not near as predictable. And it's it's not on my part. It's not like a a resentment thing. If if I had a hunting oh, show no. and I made my money by killing big deer, um, you know, I certainly wouldn't be doing it here in Florida. You know, there's there's a reason those shows aren't here in Florida. So those guys are making a living where it's best to make that living. It's absolutely not a resentment thing. It is a use that knowledge to the best of your ability and adapt to your area. But and I think then that's, set your I'm sorry. Set your expectations. I'm sorry, to set your expectations for reality. I, I love hunting Florida. I love hog hunting in Florida. Any listeners, I love hog hunting, hog hunting in South Florida with a bow. I'm a hog hypocrite. I yeah. love hunting hogs <laughs> as long as they're 500 miles or more from my house. Yeah. I love hunting hogs. I, I just want to go to some other state to hunt them there. Uh, but South Florida, man, in February, March, when the mosquitoes aren't too bad, man, chasing hogs through those palm meadows are that's an awesome sport. I listen to them. I hear them usually before I see them. Figure out how to get the wind right and spot and stalk into them. That's, that is, to me, a super fun and challenging hunt. I love that. Um, but if you're hunting deer in South Florida, and you and there's some people growing some great deer. I have some clients in South Florida that produce 150-inch deer every year, but they do a lot of habitat work. Mm -hmm. You're hunting deer in South Florida on the average ranch or public land, and you shoot a solid eight point or 115 120 130 inch deer man you should be really proud because you have accomplished something really really special mm -hmm. I, I think that's my point it don't don't set your expectations based on ag country if you're hunting sticks and timber and swamp well and i think that what i was going to say is that's something that's great about growing deer is you're <laughs> you actually have stuff to do you know it's it's not like a big ag country where like okay we're gonna plant soybeans on this field this year and, and then we're gonna plant this little clover plot here and uh you know you've got some tough habitat to work with so there's a lot of things for you to do and focus on that that people across the country can learn from well you know I, i'm from this area i was raised here I actually did my master's degree on scrape behavior of deer on public land here in this area it's a great place to raise kids. So I live here for that reason. I just happen to work here too, but I live here because it's just for me and my family, what we're looking for, lots of lakes, lots of rivers, kayaking, stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a great place to live. I just happen to be a deer biologist also. If I was to pick a point on a map and say, do not live there, it would probably be here as a deer biologist. <laughs> I, my property is split by a county. Counties in Missouri are fairly large, and my property is split by a county line almost, almost in half, just the way it worked out. And in both the counties, and I don't register deer, but both the counties, there's been one Pope and Young registered and never a Boone and Crockett. Now, I'm aware that certainly not all deer are registered. I get that. But in the old days, a higher percentage was. And people have egos. Back in the day, it was a big thing to have a Pope and Young. So if there was a whole lot being killed, there'd be more than one registered. It's just a tough place to grow good deer. Right, because they're not registering them in the south, but they're also not registering them in the north part of the state. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I know you'd be yeah. skewing those numbers if you were registering your deer. So I, I know the last few yeah, years you've had some pretty good deer. Yeah, we have. We've been very blessed here. But, you know, we're also 16 years into a habitat project. We, Trace and I, my wife, Trace and I purchased this property 16 years ago. So we got 16 years of sweat in doing prescribed fire and TSI and developing food plots and what have you. So, you know, we're 16 years 
and I'm not done yet. I got another 16 years of work. I just don't have the budget or time to get done yet. Okay, so but I got one more, is, one more question on the yeah, on the deer movement, and uh-huh. uh, and then I got a whole s- slew of other questions. We'll we'll maybe touch on a little bit, but um, you mentioned uh, okay, so we talked a little bit about the cold weather, um, and you've basically you're filming every week. What do you do when it's hot? How how are you hunting when it's hot? Okay, so two things: if it's you know ten percent warmer than normal. We're still out there, but we're hunting very close to bedding. We're thinking those deer are going to the bed a little quicker. They're still moving, but they may get in there 30 minutes quicker or something. They're still moving. They're still feeding. The rut happens. This is another thing that supports the scientists or the GPS data. The rut happens the same time every year at the same location. I know, again, just a lot different than what you're reading in a lot of magazines, but Based on, I I myself personally have collected thousands, literally thousands of fetuses from late season harvested does. We used to kill gross numbers of deer off golf courses and other research projects, whatever, as a contractor. And I'd always collect all the data. Some states require you to. So I have bunches of big three ring notebooks, three inch three ring notebooks full of data. And I can assure you, it takes some really, really big changes, not in weather. It takes changes in the adult sex ratio, big changes in the adult sex ratio to shift the mean conception date or the peak of the breeding. Big changes, not normal hunting season changes, big changes. So it's not that the rut happened a week earlier or a week later. I- I'm not throwing anyone under the bus, but I'm throwing them under the bus. That's how it works. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Based on thousands upon thousands of data points north to south, it does not happen. You may not see as much rutting activity, but next year, fawns are on the ground at the same time. Mm -hmm. When we kill those late season and look at the fetuses, they were bred at the same time, period. Let's put that myth to bed. Now, hunters, myself included, we may have a year, boy, I mean, there's scrapes and rubs everywhere and and here, you know, Halloween, man, bucks are chasing everywhere. Not all the does are receptive yet, so they're really out cruising and looking. And you're going, man, this is awesome. And probably there was favorable temperatures, and the stands I had set were conducive for deer moving in that area for a pre-rut hunt. On a really warm year, and we have them, everyone has them, Pennsylvania has them. It's 80 degrees right during the pre-rut. And you're going, man, the deer are not breeding. Well, they're breeding they're just not in the same area your stands are set because next spring, bonds are dropping at the same time. Fetuses are the same length approximately for that date whenever you're harvesting a doe. We don't worry about that. So that means we know the rut is going to occur at the same time, and we adjust our rut hunting strategies, or basically our strategies are the same, but the location of our stands are blinds based on the conditions. If it's a cool late October, early November morning, we're in the same travel corridors we've hunted in the past. If it's extra warm, we better be thinking about getting where it's cooler, creek bottom, north slope, something like that, because that's where the deer are going to be dancing. They're still going to have prom, even if it rains, shines, warm or cold. The deer are still having prom. We just got to figure out where the prom is. How long is a, do you know how long a doe is normally receptive for? Like, is, is there, how, how big is that window? Yeah, it's not too big. 24 to 36 hours on average. It's not big. So and, really, and, there's not and, a whole lot of choice in there. There's not a lot of choice. And she and if she's not bred, she'll cycle again about 28 days later. And then she'll cycle again a, a second or third time, depending on what's going on in the area. Most most areas anymore have a pretty good sex, adult sex ratio. This is all dependent on the adult sex ratio. Year and a half old bucks, folks, do just as good a job of breeding a doe as a five-year-old buck. We don't want that for a really <laughs> simple biological reason. The reason is the rut takes a buck down about 30% in body weight, 30%. That's massive. And it takes them down going right into winter when they can't recover really well. Well, if you're a big old mature buck, you can handle that weight loss a lot better than a 110-pound yearling buck, depending on where you live. When that yearling buck is really participating in the rut because there's not enough mature bucks to keep him from participating, he gets so worn down, his survival odds, and he'll likely survive, but his survival odds or his antler growth potential next year is significantly decreased, significantly decreased. 
So if you want bigger bucks, balance that adult sex ratio. And, and still, yes, the young bucks will breed. They're just not running all over the country because there's enough mature bucks that they don't have as many opportunities. But this may surprise you, and you probably know this, but at least 25% of twin fawns are stepbrother and stepsister. The doe was bred by two different bucks or more during that 24 to 36 hour period. Hmm. And it's and it's just whichever buck semen got to the eggs first. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not uncommon at all for turkey poults out of the same clutch to have be, to be from seven or eight different gobblers. Because that hen is going to breed a lot during the turkey breeding season. Mm -hmm. And does often have multiple partners. We don't think like that because of humans and morality in humans, but does often have a lot of partners. And it's very common for the twin fawns to be stepbrother, stepsister. Well, from a, from a deer, (laughs) biologically speaking, from a deer standpoint, since the, the, the father's not sticking around to help out, it really makes sense to like, you know, increase your odds with multiple options, you know? Diversifies the gene pool. Makes mm-hmm. the gene pool, you know, I hear all the time deer genetics, deer genetics, deer genetics, a lot of hog wars. If you're a captive deer breeder and you're line breeding, which means you're taking bucks or does with favorable traits, more milk, bigger antlers, whatever it is, and you're breeding that line, which is inbreeding. We call it line breeding if it's successful and inbreeding if it's not successful. <laughs> it's the exact same practice. Hmm. But that only works if you have a pedigree. You know, several generations that, boy, this doe has male fawns that have larger antlers. Antlers are about 70% related to the doe, not bucks. That's why culling deer based on antlers never works. Never works. Never works. Period. It's all about pedigrees. And there are no pedigrees in the wild. So culling bucks in the wild will only result on free-ranging wild herds, only results in fewer bucks. This research has been done Many times in wild free-ranging deer, it does not work. Calling bucks only results in fewer bucks. But in America, in North America, in the United States anyway, doe harvest has been down about 20% for several years in a row now. We've reversed the trend for years. We're doing a good job. Now we're not. And there's way too many deer on the landscape in most places. You know, hunters go, I ain't seen deer. I don't know what that guy's talking about. But <laughs> in most states, there's too many deer, and that's causing habitat problems and deer herd problems. We need to reduce the number of deer in a lot of areas through doe harvest, not through more buck harvest, through doe harvest. Okay, so going back to the rut and the GPS, there's a couple couple questions with that I wanted to ask you about. What are your feelings on the October lull as far as deer movement goes? Boy, it sure seems like I'm seeing it as a hunter, and in this really odd life I live as a scientist, I know it doesn't happen. (laughs) When I'm in my stand and not seeing any deer on October 15th, the October lull theory sounds really good to me. Yeah. (laughs) And when I look at data I've collected or other people have collected, I go, well, gosh, I'm not a very good hunter. The deer were moving. (laughs) So I think, I think in a lot, and you don't hear a lot of people talking about that in ag areas. You hear more people talking about that in acorn driven deer herds. So we go from deer eating on summer forage, forbs and, you know, plots and stuff like that, native vegetation plots all summer, and all of a sudden acorns hit the ground, a lot of acorns usually Mm -hmm. at the first part. And stand sites need to change, and deer are very spread out. They're not in a two-acre food plot. They're in 400 acres of timber. They're very spread out. So I think that's one possible explanation. Uh, Hormones are changing range shifts are occurring bucks are now really amping up testosterone and they're moving to new areas the bachelors are not friendly with each other anymore they went from liking each other to disliking each other and deer are using different parts of their home range and so you got these doe groups have been comfy all summer and now you got strange bucks moving into their area because they moved out of where the bachelor group was and everyone's kind of on edge. There's just a lot going on. And I think it's more of a deer behavior thing, not all the deer are taking a nap. Mm-hmm. And and on top of all those things, a lot of times the hunting pressure ramps up right around the beginning of October. So um, Hunting pressure ramps up. The days are cooler. People get out in the woods. There's a lot of things going on there. People still kill good deer at that time. But many of our traditional stands, mine included, are not that effective during that time. 
It just seems similar to the to the cold weather thing. You know, it's not necessarily that they're not moving, but they're not moving the same places you would normally see them, or you know, something something along those lines. Again, my 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 stock hunting buddies that never hunt out of a blind or stand, and they're they have a lot of time, their job or unemployed or whatever allows them to have a lot of time, are successful in all conditions. Deer are moving. It's a matter of us being where the deer are. Mm-hmm. And, and another thing we got to accept, there are times when deer are in such areas, for whatever reason, they're in areas that are not really easy to hunt. I mean, when, when if you have limited acorns, you're on that edge between timber and prairie, and there's not a lot of acorns. And the acorns fall, and there's not a lot of acorns on your property, and they're in very limited distribution. I mean, it's like a feeder. You know exactly where the deer are going to be. It's better than a feeder because most feeders get so overhunted, deer become very nocturnal there. The acorns are like a brand new feeder that's never been hunted, at least hadn't been hunted for a year. But when you're in an area like where I live, or you live in Florida where there's acorns everywhere, it's just the reverse. It it makes hunting very tough. Yeah. Because they're so spread. Okay. So on the same theme of those, this is the last one with that, but what about the lockdown phase um, as far as that phase of the rut and deer not moving during that period? absolutely real by all data by gps data and everything now it's not as strong a trend on the gps data but it just makes sense so those are receptive 24 to 36 hours uh at the peak of the rut peak of breeding hunters often define peak of the rut as when they're seeing the most signs scrapes rubs or deer chasing that's probably pre-rut during the peak of the rut is not a good time to hunt because most of the bucks are staying about 20 yards from a doe in a thicket somewhere and they'll stay there for about a day or longer. And then when she doesn't want to dance anymore, they'll go try to find another one. And they usually find one pretty quickly. So there's just limited time bucks are on their feet. And if you're the guy that sees the booner running across the white open cow pasture, you're saying, man, the rut's the greatest time to hunt there ever was. If you're the rest of us that aren't seeing much right during the peak of the rut, you're going, man, this doggone lockdown <laughs> phase is horrible. Yeah, and, and I absolutely believe and have witnessed that my data shows the lockdown phase. And and if you're in an area where there has not been as much doe harvest, then you may not see it quite as much. If you're in a balanced adult sex ratio, one buck per doe, and 80% of the does or 70 or 60% of the does are in heat at the same time, and sometimes there's two or three bucks per doe, there's not a lot of deer moving. The does that aren't receptive are laying low because they're tired of being bothered by pesky bucks. And the does that are receptive, they're not moving because every time they stand up, something bad happens. So, yeah, I'm absolutely, absolutely believe in the lockdown phase. Matter of fact, Missouri's rifle season is always on, I think it's the second Saturday in November. So it changes one day a year. It's, it's going to start a maximum of seven days earlier or later, and it rotates one day a year. This year, it smacked down where I live right during the lockdown phase, and it was really tough hunting. We couldn't we couldn't buy a deer. Hmm. And, and I'm hunting, and we had good weather. It was cold. I was wearing coats, all that. And I and I video deer, and you, man, you'd see one doe and three bucks behind her, and they'd run over in the bushes or native grass and lay down, and you'd sit there for two hours waiting for them to stand up, and they're just they're just there. So on that line during that time of year, guys, one of the best things you can do. And we have lots of video of this year after year. We did it this year. Year after year after year, we get it. I'm going to harvest a doe in Missouri. I can harvest a doe and a buck with a rifle. I'm going to harvest a doe. I'm going to try for a double shoulder shot. I'm going to drop her right there on the spot. I don't know if she's receptive or not receptive. Any doe smells good to a buck at that time. Hmm. And I have killed many bucks years in a row right over a doe I shot that morning. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. I, I, you probably have several episodes over the yeah over the years where several. anybody can go watch it. Yeah, for years, for years we've used that strategy. My favorite time, if I could take one more rabbit trail, I'm so sorry, I'm, my brain goes fast. Please, that's I, I love it. My favorite time, folks, to hunt mature bucks is just the opposite of what you think. It's late season, late season. I shouldn't want to do that because there's less bucks, right? They've been during someone else's freezer, or they've been killed in an accident, or what, they broke an antler off, or whatever's happened. There's less viable bucks to put a tag on. The magic of late season, if you have fairly good habitat and your female fawns, depending on where you live, are weighing at least 60 or 70 pounds in late season, they probably have reached puberty. 
And unlike adult does that's been to the dance several times, they have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and they in late season, most of the acorns are gone. It depends on where you live. And these female fawns walk out into a food plot every afternoon. And all of a sudden, there's five bucks behind her. Where adult does, and again, this has been shown by GPS, when they're becoming receptive, they typically what's called drop their fawns and go to a different part of their home range. Makes sense. You don't want a bunch of old nasty bucks around your fawns. They drop their fawns or leave their fawns for a few days and go to a different part of their home range. So you're hunting a food plot. During the rut, during the November rut, if the rut's in November where you live, and there's 20 does coming to a plot every afternoon, you're saying, man, this is awesome. I got a buck magnet here. You have a bunch of does. The does that you really want to be by, the does that are probably receptive, they broke off of that big group of deer, does and fawns, and go to a different part of their home range. That's why I hunt primarily bedding areas or ways in and out of bedding areas or thick cover during the rut. I want to be where the receptive does are. Because where the receptive does are or where the bucks are going to be. I don't want to be where I see the most does. I want to be where the does that are ready to go to the prom are. And that's in thick cover somewhere. But late season, female fawns that become receptive and they're naive to the rut, they come prancing out in that food plot every afternoon. And I have tagged several good late season bucks by using trail cameras to find where a bunch of fawns are feeding and hunting that area just waiting for one to become receptive. I've tagged a bunch of bucks using that strategy. You know, just hearing you so, talk you know, about all these. Alabama, if you're in Alabama, by the way, that doesn't work because the rut comes in about time season's getting over in most yeah. of Alabama. So, you know, <laughs> you got to think that through. They did. I think they just this last year, they bumped it out another two weeks because of that. Uh, you know, a lot yeah. of. Yes. I'd, I would assume then maybe the actually the the pre rut time you're talking about maybe a week or two when those does aren't actually in heat and they are in the field but the bucks are still out looking maybe that's even a, a better chance if you're on food plots versus actually the the peak of the rut. Great point. You're exactly right. And oftentimes I will hunt 50 yards off the food plot back in the timber where I think that buck is scent checking that field. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, go back to. The, to our great Navy SEAL warriors. They're, they're most at danger when they're on maneuvers, and they know that, so they take extra precaution, and mature bucks will often do the same. So uh, just hearing you talk about all these different scenarios and your buddies that do the spot and stock, it just makes me think, man, I need to try that a little more often this upcoming season. Just thinking about the rut, you know, the lockdown phase, well, if you can find, if you're moving and you find where that doe is, then you'll be the guy that says, oh, there's tons of action because you were in that tiny little pocket. Oh, it's yeah, easier. I got to tell you, it is, it is, it takes, it takes a good bit of woodsmanship skill to be successful. You don't ever get there unless you try and keep trying mm-hmm. during the rut, during the rut, I would much rather be in a stand or a blind with a good vantage point watching a thick area. One, there are not many advantages to hunting hill or mountain country. There are not many. The thermals are horrible. <laughs> it's steep land. You can't put food blocks many places. There's a lot of negatives. One advantage is, is in, 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 while gun hunting anyway, yeah. you can sit on one hillside and have a perfect view into the other hillside. If you're level, like the big you know, CRP field in Nebraska, you can't see through it that well. You just can't get high enough to see down in it. But when you're in hill country, you can see from one side into the other side really well. And our, our rut is, again basically during Missouri's firearm season. And, and I will just find me a perch in a blind a rock, whatever, and watch into that distant hillside where I've cut trees and saw thick and gnarly. And, and that's my go-to hunting strategy every year for that time of year. Yeah. That's how you got it done this year, right? Yes. I, I'll do it again next year. I mean, I can just promise you. <laughs> that's, that's one cool thing about uh, bow hunting. Like bow hunting, there is something to like trying to pinpoint exactly where they're going to go or sitting right top of a food source or that kind of stuff. But it's fun gun hunting that you basically are looking for that area where you can see a large area. You get to see a lot of stuff and, uh, it might not be as up close and personal, but, uh, you know, there's a lot more movement when you see a, a big area. I typically see a lot more deer from my gun stands or blinds and I do does because you know i've got a weapon that can reach on out there so i want to see more bow Mm -hmm. hunting i tend to hunt pretty tight places and i often can't see more than 30 40 50 yards i'm not hunting a wide wide open oak flat where i can see 300 yards because i'm gonna get busted and you know you know it's just a lot of negatives there but 
so I, I like them both. I'm not one of these guys is boy, you're, you know, you're a gun hunter, or you're a bow hunter. You know, I grew up on the recurves and I still have a bunch on the wall right here in my office where I'm looking, but I, I like it all. I, I, my daughter uses a crossbow. That's great. Uh, I, I, I just want people outside enjoying creation and hunting. I don't care what legal tool they use. Me too. If it's legal, I'm using it <laughs> Well, for the most part. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. We okay. need more hunters. We don't need vision. We need more hunters. So this isn't my favorite topic, but I do want to hit on a little bit, especially since uh, the last time I saw you, this is what we were talking about, is is CWD. And I think you have a unique perspective on it because of managing your own property. And unfortunately for you, you're right in the, the heart of some of the problem areas. So um, I guess I'll just kind of leave it open as far as um, addressing what it is and and what some of the misconceptions are and, and what you're doing about it. It's a really dark subject. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview based first from my scientist point of view. Let me say, I am not a disease pathologist. I, I, I'm very involved with CWD. I'm on some committees and I sit on some committees with some really world renowned disease pathologists. So I learn from them and regurgitate. I'm uh, that's not my field of study. CWD is a very insidious disease uh, in that it's it takes a long time to incubate. It's not obvious. It's not a big outbreak like EHD. And can I put one myth to bed? People say, I get this email all the time. Well, you know, Grant, man, I found seven deer around my pond or an EHD. I've never found a dead CWD deer. You found a deer around your pond of EHD because A, they all died in a pretty short time frame, and B, because of, of the 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 method, I won't get into much detail, that kills deer with EHD, epizootic hemorrhagic disease, they're very unpalatable to scavengers or predators. Hmm. I have looked at hundreds or thousands of EHD dead deer in my 30-year career, and I've yet to see one where coyotes ripped it apart. Never. CWD deer get killed like crazy by predators before they die. They start getting weak, you know, they're obviously easy. They're very easy prey, and predators munch on them like crazy and don't get the disease. They wouldn't get EHD either, but they stink and they're unpalatable. So we're not going to find a lot of carcasses from CWD. I shot a hog in South Florida, like I talked about earlier, my bow this spring. Of course, took the meat off of it, left it. May I skinned it out. Mosquitoes are horrible, so I skinned it out and processed it really quickly and my flashlight light maybe seven yards from the edge of, of some thick palm meadows, drug it out to the edge and got the meat off of it. Went by there the next morning, turkey hunting. So in less than 14 hours, there were a few ribs left. Mm -hmm. There's so many scavengers and predators in America anymore, literally, that CWD carcasses are not going to be found like EHD. So that's just one myth. It is a disease. It is real. It is spreading. No one knows if it started in the Colorado pins or not. So why argue about it? We will never know that. So quit arguing about where it started. <laughs> it doesn't matter. What matters is it is a disease. We don't know a lot about it. We know two things. It moves a lot in the back of a pickup by live deer being transported, either state agencies restocking or captive deer people moving. And it moves in the back of pickups and trucks and cars and whatever else. In deer parts, you go to an area, Kansas, wherever, kill a deer that wasn't tested. It has CWD. You bring it back. Once you get home, you bone it out. And you throw the spinal column in the brain on the back 40, and a coyote or a crow or whatever eats it, or the prions just go in the soil, and it gets taken up by a plant, and the deer eats it, and bingo, we got a little hot spot. So if I was the deer czar, which I do not want to be, um, I would make it where we can't move any deer and hunters only move B-bone meat, antlers, and pelts if you're going to mount it. And you leave the rest. You know, I'm not saying right there where it dropped, but within that county, somewhere where if it's already, if it's already infected, you're not taking it to a new place. Mm -hmm. That's the two things that we know work. We know that works, and we can do that now. We don't need any laws, regulations. We can do that now. I am in a seat now from a hunter. I'm in a CWD zone. A neighbor of mine on 80 acres shot a yearling buck that tested positive for CWD this year. We've tested for many years. This is the first positive. I was not surprised. As a crow flies, I'm about 15 miles out of Arkansas. In Arkansas, 
northern Arkansas, north central Arkansas, has a prevalence rate of over 20%. Wow. Deer move, folks. Oh, this deer moves five miles, it breeds, or a deer kisses it or whatever, and it gets the prion, and that deer moves five miles. It's easy to go 15 miles. So I was not surprised. I was thrilled it was a yearling buck, because yearling bucks tend to disperse and move a lot. It would have been bad if it was a mature doe. Mature does tend to have much smaller home ranges, and they groom the other deer in their group almost daily. And so if we would shot one mature doe that was positive, there would have been a bunch. The state come in. In Missouri, the protocol is if you find just one, one positive, they take a 25-mile 20, square area, which is about a two-mile circle. It's not, you know, four counties. And allow those landowners extra tags after season to collect more samples. They had seminars. There was like 250 landowners in the core area. Not all of them participated. Matter of fact, a minority. Now, some of these are, are lots. There's a few little developments somewhat close by me. I'm rural, but in that area, there was some lots and whatnot. So anyway, uh, not all the landowners participated. We did, and I make a living off deer, folks. I love deer. My kids are named after deer. Raleigh, Old English for the, by the excuse me, Old English for dweller by the deer meadow, and Ray, R-A-E, Hebrew for doe. Deer impact everything in my life, period. When the state come around and offered permits, I was a cooperator. And from February 1st, I think it was, to March 15th, and I'm giving seminars almost every weekend during that time, but my employees, my friends, whoever, were harvesting deer on my property. Not because I liked it, because it is the right thing to do. It's not pleasant. It impacts a lot of things. It was the right thing to do. Fortunately, out of 100 small deer harvested in the unit, not off my property, we had a lot of acorns. Everyone had trouble killing deer. And, mm. You know, deer were not coming to bait piles or anything like that. Uh, there was no more policies found. That was a blessing. So we yeah. had one yearling yeah. buck. Heck, he could have walked up here from Arkansas. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, we had one yearling buck. We will sample again next year. If we sample for three years and don't find any more, it's back to regular regulation. That's pretty fair, folks. That's, that's you know, everyone says, oh, my gosh, that's horrible. Well, there's slaughtered deer. No one has wiped out deer. No one's slaughtering deer. I don't like it. I do not like it. But it's the right thing to do, and I'm hoping we don't find any more posies. Would I bet on that? No. We're too close to a large herd that has 20-plus percent posies. Deer are moving around. We're going to find more. But it is the right thing to do. No. What can we do in the future? There's a couple of bills in the Senate and the House. I'm talking to federal government. I'm not politically motivated at all. Um, that are trying to get funding to study. We we are monitoring CWD. We need to study CWD. We need real money. Folks, this is very expensive work. None of it goes to me. Again, I'm not a disease pathologist. None of it goes to me. I don't really want to see it go to five different wildlife schools. I'm with the University of Georgia and Clemson. There's other good schools. Wildlife biologists are not disease pathologists. I would like the majority of the funding, and I'm telling everyone this, you've got a big audience, so they can write their senators and their congressmen and whoever. There's a university called Case Western. They were very involved in Mad Cow. They're involved in the human form. By the way, no human has ever got CWD, contrary to what some people publish. No human has, period. Thank God. Mm -hmm. uh, we, can, we can teach the Case Western brilliant university researchers about deer much quicker than they can teach us disease pathology, much, much quicker. So let's don't waste five more years of funding XYZ universities because they got a good wildlife habitat program, but they don't have a disease pathologist on staff. Let's don't do that. Let's go to the best on the planet. Let's go to Case Western, and we can teach them deer biology really quickly. They don't even have to be out in the field. We can bring them samples. We just need them to learn the disease and what we can do with anything to treat it, stop it, prevent it from spreading. What I don't know those answers, whatever they are. And and that's my take on CWD. I get asked by state agencies or other people to speak, and sometimes they don't like my answers because <laughs> the bottom line at the end of the day is we need to stop moving deer. Everyone agrees on this. It doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on. Everyone agrees. We need to stop moving deer and deer parts because that helps CWD spread faster. It's going to spread deer to deer but it can spread much faster in a pickup going 70 miles an hour down the road. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have it in your neighborhood, folks, you do not want it. You do not. You don't want to be Grant Woods and make a living with deer 
and the state comes and says, Grant, we need you to help us. We need you to kill some deer after season. You do not want to be in that position. Heaven forbid you don't. So please, folks, please, I'm begging you, work for all of us, for the good of everyone. I'm not anti deer breeders. This is not that. For the good of all deer, in fence, out of fence, wild free ranging, which is, by the way, the vast majority of what pays for all wildlife management on the planet, folks. The Pittman Robinson Act. I'm mm-hmm. going way off here. I'm so sorry. Funds. Trails, everything else, folks. We got to keep the deer going. Without white-tailed deer, hunting is dead. It is dead. There's not enough elk, d- ducks, goose, quail killed to be a pimple on the butt of deer hunting. Mm-hmm. We have to keep deer going to fund conservation for these other species. Stop moving deer. Voluntarily stop moving deer parts. Debone the deer. We made a very easy. I debone. I was deboning deer 20 years ago. Debone your deer. You don't have to have near big a cooler, near as much ice. The meat tastes better. Debone your deer. Leave the skeleton in the field. Bring the antlers home. Bring the pelt home. Debone the deer. Make your family happy and stop the spread of CWD. If you don't know how to debone the deer, there's no fee. There's no money. We have a really simple video on how to debone deer. It's the most played hunting video Bass Pro's ever had, I believe. It may have changed, but last they told me it was. It's just about, it's not a brand of anything. It's just me in an old barn teaching you how to debone a deer. It's really quick and simple. I actually use a lot of some of your methods I've seen on your show to, you know, make, you know, cut different roasts and that kind of stuff right off, right off the deer where you're not cutting the leg off. You're actually cutting, cutting roasts out and that stuff and, right when the deer is hanging. You know, whether it's CWD or a lung infection or whatever else, you don't want to be eating lymph nodes, folks. There's some major ones in the ham. You don't want to be eating that. So just take the time. To debone the deer, it, it falls apart real simply. And whether you take that to a processor to be finalized or you process it at home, whatever is okay, just debone the deer. Your meat will be better. Your family will like it better. It's just better, period, and simple. Okay, two more things that I know impacted you directly with the CWD is um, mineral attractants and uh, natural deer urine attractants. Yep. So we are now using synthetic deer urine. Uh, I get, if you watch the show, I get tons, I mean, thousands of pictures in bucks and scrapes where we've used, we use code blue, where we're using a synthetic product. I have not found any difference. So that was an easy sacrifice for me. At first you go, oh my gosh, I've used this for years and I can't use it. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a gut punch, mm-hmm. but I'm going to be legal. I'm going to be legal. So I went to synthetic and we've been thrilled. That one was a gut punch. And then, oh, that wasn't very tough at all. It's like getting your first flu shot or something. It, and the mineral was a little tougher. I really like Trophy Rock. It's natural. There's 65 trace minerals. Everyone worries about, boy, I need to get my deer a lot of calcium or a lot of phosphorus. And this goes back to Lee Biggs, Law of the Minimum, old German scientist that says, if you drill a little hole in the bottom of the bucket, no matter how much water you pour in the top, it's going to drain out that little straw hole in the bottom of the bucket. And what he was illustrating was if your deer are short on zinc or boron or sulfur or something you don't really think about, it doesn't matter how much calcium and phosphorus you pour in there, they can only function as well as that least available mineral. So I like trophy rock because it's natural mined in Utah and has about 60 plus different trace minerals in it. It's usually the trace minerals, not the big minerals, which are the, the difference. We're finding the same thing true in ag, by the way. So if you're on degraded soil, You've been tilling forever. The farmer's been tilling forever and a lot of erosion. Let's just face the fact, your soil is degraded. Putting a trace mineral out there is not a bad thing, except it makes deer come nose to nose. And it doesn't matter if it's CWD or, again, you know, lungworm or something else, just like kids at preschool. If one kid's sick, they all get sick. If you're putting deer nose to nose, it may not be the best thing. So I switched to plot rock, which is ground-up trophy rock. And I spread it over my whole plot, and I like it better now that, I, again, I got after that gut punch. I just want to throw my rock out, and deer come, and I get great trophy in the pictures. I mean, yeah. that's trophy rock, right? It's awesome. It's incredible. And I wish I could still do that, but I can't legally. So I've switched to plot rock. I was instrumental in getting trophy rock to switch over and make plot rock because, again, you know, you need it. You work hard to make it happen. Ground it up. And I spread it like fertilizer on my plot, and all the plants can now take up these 60-plus trace minerals, and the plants are more palatable, and I'm getting deer there, and my plants are better, the deer like it, and they're getting the minerals. So I just had to find a workaround. 
Mm-hmm. It's still available, still perfectly legal in every state, perfectly legal. It's a soil amendment, perfectly legal. And I'm accomplishing the same thing. It's not quite as easy as, you know, hopping in your UTV and you got five rocks and bat and you go throw them out somewhere and you're done. It's not quite that simple, but it's probably better, actually. It's probably better. All right. Last one, CWD. What are you doing as far as like eating the deer? Are you testing your deer before you eat them? And what happens when one tests positive? Now, I don't want to say uh, the worst happens. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but yeah, yeah, let's yeah. assume it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, No, I understand. So in the past, we've tested some deer just to help the state get samples from the area. We did not test every deer. You know, it's you hit a deer back, you find it at 2 a.m., you get into the house, you, you know, you got it. You, you, it wasn't convenient, to be honest. It wasn't convenient. So we did. We tested the convenient ones. Now we will test them all. I'm not too worried. I mean, I'm a real family man. If you watch me, I'm a super family man. Love my family dearly. I would never take the chance of harming them. Mm-hmm. We're still eating deer meat. We got a freezer full. So there's GADS research that shows it's really tough for CWD to go to humans in its current state. Diseases often change over time. Like there's a different flu vaccine almost every year. Diseases change over time. So I'm not saying in the future, I'm not saying it will, I'm not saying it won't, I'm saying no one knows. But right now, if you think about, and I mean this literally, the millions of elk, caribou, moose, mule deer, white-tailed deer consumed, knowing that CWD is in 26 states, three provinces, a couple foreign countries, and not one case of it going to humans, Take all the science aside, just consider the sheer magnitude of those numbers, pretty doggone safe. You're probably a lot more likely to be killed in a car wreck going to the grocery store to buy some hormone-fed beef. So, yeah, we're eating it. We will start testing if we had meat come back positive. No, I wouldn't eat it. Of course not. That's a, It's going to be one in a million. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm putting that in a landfill. I'm putting <laughs> that deer in a landfill. I'm not throwing it on back 40. That's just going to let scavengers eat it and spread the disease. Mm-hmm. I'm putting it in a lined landfill, so it can't be out on the habitat. Haven't faced that yet. This year, we will test all deer, or almost all. I'm not saying we won't have that 2 a.m. gut shot deer we find, and you know, but we're going to test almost every deer, and we will label. We label. We do this anyway, you know, raised buck, Raleigh's doe, Grant's button buck, whatever it is, you know, <laughs> and we label it when we put it in the freezer, just so we know when we're eating which deer it was. Um, but, yeah, we will label them, and we won't eat that deer. In Missouri, you get results back in about two weeks. They're really good. Yeah. We've always got plenty of venison. So, yeah, we will we will test and label, and that is the smart thing to do. That is the smart thing to do. But Colorado, it's been a few years ago, we looked at, I think, the seven north central counties where CWD is really prevalent, and 75% of the mule deer and elk tags sold there are by residents. So you think there's a lot of people eating elk and mule deer in that part of Colorado, just again, looking at the sheer numbers. Yeah. And they look at the health records from those seven counties compared to the United States. And there was no greater incident of any neurological disease than anywhere else, even in states that have no CWD known anyway. So yeah, I'm just not worried about it right now. That doesn't mean we shouldn't take precautions, but well, yeah, my no family is still the first one. You don't want to be folks. This is a hundred percent lethal disease. It's, this is not where some deer live. That, People saying that, that's that's inaccurate. I know the state vet of Wyoming, she has had pins that inadvertently deer died of CWD early on. Every elk they put in that pen for many years since, over years, not that first day, over years, dies of CWD, period. We don't guess here. We're not guessing. There are many, many rumors and over lies being told about CWD, which is harmful for the whole sport, folks. Truth is always best, even when it's the truth we don't want to accept. And so, yeah, CWD is 100% fatal as far as we know. There could be a deer out there in the landscape that live, but it's not a genetic thing. You see all these articles, well, there's a, there's a certain genotype that, no, no, that's never been shown in research at all. What it does show is there's a certain genotype where deer tend to live about a year longer, which is bad because that's another year for them to it's urinate, good. defecate, salivate, ejaculate all over the landscape and spread the disease more. Is it, and the way CWD works, is that basically, is it immune? It, I mean, I know how it affects the brain, but it lowers the immune system where a, a lot of times it's something else that kills them, but it's because they had no, CWD. No, 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 no. 
no, 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 no. Yes and no, but mainly no. Okay. So CWD is a bent protein that somehow causes other proteins to bend. And that's why it's called a spongiform. These proteins will bend in such a way, and I'm talking microscopic, not like a big slice of Swiss cheese, but you will see under a microscope holes in the deer's brain. Mm -hmm. So they don't act right, right? You know, if you got holes in your brain, you're probably not acting right today (laughs) either. So so as, as that, and it doesn't show up for like 18 months to two years after they're infected. It's not like EHD where they're dead in three days. Mm-hmm. So in the first year or so, they act perfectly normal, look perfectly normal, act perfectly normal. There's no way by looking at them, you can go, boy, that deer's got a disease. They look normal. I'm sure every year thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of VHD positive deer are shot and consumed, and no one knows any different. They're doing just fine. But as this, this disease enters its end stage, there's so many holes in the brain and other nerve tissue that deer walk around in circles or jump through windows, or this is why the states that do a really good job and test a lot of roadkill deer find a really high prevalence of CWD in roadkill deer. They're just not as likely to avoid the car as healthy C- as healthy deer. Mm-hmm. Roadkill deer, I call that targeting targeted sampling. And I got to tell you, in a lot of areas, I wish states would do a lot more targeted sampling than just random culling. That's been proven to be effective. You know, that someone calls in and says, well, I got a deer walking circles in my yard. A sample needs to be collected out of that deer yeah. every single time. Roadkill deer need to be sampled. They need to be sampled. That's a very high prevalence rate sample. I'm not saying we shouldn't do some sampling on the landscape, but by golly, some of the first money spent should be sampling target likely deer. Mm-hmm. Deer that are more likely to have the disease. And that way we can detect it, see where it is. And then adjust seasons and regulations based on that. Our goal is to hold this at bay. The end goal right now, based on the current state of the knowledge, is to hold this at bay, this disease at bay, until we can get really good research and figure out what's the next step. No one knows that next step yet. we got to get out of the cycle of just monitoring. We have to progress to research and seeing what the next step is. And I think everyone, captive deer folks, Hunters, biologists, we all agree on that. We have to get to the research phase of fighting this disease. All right. So I got a couple questions for you. Basically, I want to ask you these because I know you follow uh, things with a biological mindset and a hunter's mindset, and and you're not afraid to share your opinion. So I got a couple Southern hot topics I wanted to ask you about. Um, Mm -hmm. How about the declining turkey populations that a lot of Southern states are seeing um what do you think is behind those and and maybe what should be done about it gosh i love the turkey hunt i mean i love the interaction of turkey hunting it's not just southern states uh missouri's harvest and i don't have the number so again please don't give me the hate email uh <laughs> but 12 years ago 14 years ago i'm in the right range i may be off a year or two we tagged 60 some odd thousand birds in missouri this year we tagged 32,000. I mean, that's a decline, folks, by any standard. Last year, we tagged slightly more this year than we did last year. Last year was like the lowest in modern record keeping of Missouri. And Missouri is like a massive turkey state, folks. People drive from all over to hunt turkeys in Missouri. Uh, so there's clearly some stuff going on. Here's some stuff we know. And, and I got a buddy. Uh, uh, I got a buddy, Daniel. Daniel, if you're listening, I'm giving you some credit right here. Uh, <laughs> Daniel's really into numbers and math and does a great, great job. Uh, Daniel plotted out the other day Missouri's turkey harvest over the last, whatever, 14, 15 years and fur license sales, trapper, trapper license sales. The line, and, and remember, uh, let me state this to all the scientists listening. I am not saying this is cause and effect. You cannot show this, but it's data. Okay. I, I made good grades in stat classes, <laughs> but it's pretty curious that the decline in trappers' license sales and decline in turkey populations almost mirror each other 100%. If one bubs up, the other bubs up. If one bubs down, the other one bubs down. Hmm. It's not cause and effect, but it sure smells like cause and effect. Right now, we're working on plotting out rain differences between normal, more or less, for April, May, and June in Missouri versus these turkey harvest trends. Because we know, like here at my place, the last two years we've had, including this year, we've had massive rains during nesting season. I think I'm having about 100% re-nest at my ranch. 
gobbling and hens walking around. I mean, my hens were on nests, man. You did not see a hen step in the afternoon out pecking a little bit. Hmm. And now I, you see hens going to gobblers right now. I think it's 100% renest here. Trying to. It won't be successful, but trying to. So I think changes in weather. Don't let, don't give me a bunch of hate mail, folks. Uh, <laughs> there's no doubt. There's No one disagrees there's more coons out there. My guys, there's coons behind every trash can out there in America. There's coons everywhere. Uh I, I can't kill enough coons on my place. My neighbors don't trap. I cannot trap enough coons. Each year, there's more and more. Uh, and, and, and so when you have a wet season, a wet nesting season, if you've ever killed a turkey during a rainstorm, you know how much they smell. They're horrible smelling. So a turkey hen will, will lay, let's just say, an average of 8 to 10 eggs, depending on where you are. Okay, so that's 8 to 10 days. She's going to a nest on the ground, one particular place, and leaving scent. And then she's going to incubate for about 28 days. So now we're 38 days on the ground. She's going to sit there overnight. And then the pokes are about 14 days old before they can fly. So now she's another 14 days on the ground, 24-7, and all those pokes. If it rains several times in there, she's putting off a lot of odor. Hmm. And a coon, possum, coyote, bobcat, domestic dog, they're horrible on turkey nests walks downwind within a couple hundred yards, that nest is gone every time. Well, folks, this year on my roughly 2,000 acres of land, we removed 80 couple predators. That's a predator for every 30 acres, give or take. 52 days on the ground, you're telling me a predator didn't get close to that nest just by random happenstance, Mm -hmm. and it's really rainy, and they smell that nest or they smell the hen? How could you survive? When you put it in that way, when you show it in that way, the chances of survival. So in Missouri, we feel really good if we average 1.1 pokes per hen. That's replacement. That's not population gaining. That's replacement. Yeah, really. Yeah, probably wildlife, less than that. Yeah. Yeah. Even the Wildlife Society, which is ultra, ultra, I'm a member, it's kind of like our union, <laughs> professional society, uh, ultra conservative on protecting predators. They're warm, fuzzy, brown hair, big eyes. You know, ultra, ultra conservative. Lord help us, someone kills a predator. Finally admitted last year in a major publication on the decline of turkeys. This is known. It's not a rumor. It, turkey populations are declining. That may, they said maybe predators are an issue. Maybe. What well, bus did you crawl out from under? Maybe. <laughs> My guy. We, we fragmented the habitat, which favors most species of predators. There's a hawk on top of every telephone pole when you ride down a highway in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's bad. It's just real, folks. It's real. Hawks are predators. They eat easy prey. A turkey poke is really easy prey. There's coons everywhere. There's bobcats everywhere. I mean, there's more bobcats than there's ever been, literally ever been. There's coyotes everywhere. There's feral cats by the hundreds of thousands out there, hundreds of thousands. And there's one species, of, one, one type of turkey, folks. There's turkeys out there, and they stink a lot when they get wet. We've had some really rainy springs. I look for next year to be worse than this year. I think recruitment this year is going to be horrible in many Midwestern states due to the rain and flooding. I think we're in real problems on turkeys, and I think we will probably see some adjustments to bag limits. Yeah, yeah. Well, and hopefully that can be I'll a temporary that- thing. You know, maybe maybe if they have enough science on this stuff where, you know what, we didn't have a good year last year, let's – you know, let's cut it back and you have a good year. Maybe you can and kill some more birds. Yeah. And so cutting it back doesn't matter if you have a 10 inch rain and it wipes out all your nests. You know, it doesn't matter. I mean, they're just, they're just not much production. I'd like to share one last thing with you. I've taken a lot of time with you and your audience. I, I like to, I got a really good friend in South Alabama. He, he's, he's actually Andy Andrews. He's a multiple time New York times bestselling author. I mean, no, he's the man. He likes to hunt. He writes all these books that are printed in 70 languages, but He's a good old boy when he comes hunting. I like to hunt with Andy. I learn a lot from him. And Andy shared with me, he's a member of a great, big, really, really old hunting club down South Alabama. I won't say the name, but really old, old gentleman's type hunting club. Great place to hunt because most of the guys aren't too serious of hunters. You know, they sit around playing cards, smoking stogies. So if you like <laughs> to hunt, you got the whole place to yourself. And one of the old guys in there, Andy, asked him, said, well, what do you think happened to all the turkeys around here? These have some awesome hunting in South Alabama. And the old man, I'll, I'll try it for about three words and I'll quit because I can't do it right. He said, well, Andy, I believe all these doggone social programs. I'm thinking, boy, this guy's political. What does a social program have to do with turkey population? He said, you know, used to, everybody had a little garden. And you had some chickens for eggs, fresh eggs. You had garden chickens. So 
If you saw a snake or a coon, you shot it, or your mama shot it, or the son shot it. Somebody shot it because that meant you didn't have any eggs or chickens the next day. And everyone trapped because that's how you got a little extra Christmas money to put a G.I. Joe under the tree. I'm starting to track with him now, and I'll drop his South Alabama accent. <laughs> and he carried it all out and said, you know, there's not a lot of people living on the land anymore. They're moving to urban areas. Well, that, that fact is true, right? That's indisputable. Mm-hmm. And certainly the amount of fur produced in America is way down. Prices are down. Steel prices are up. Gas prices are up. As a realistic example, folks, on 57, when I was in high school, an extra large coon, where I live here in southern Missouri, was $44. If you were on a date and you saw a big coon roadkill on the road, you stopped and threw it in the truck and your date was happy because that meant you had money to buy gas <laughs> on the date again next Friday night. Literally. Literally. No one even thinks about that now. And there are very few trappers because steel is higher, gas is higher. And last year, coon prices in my area were $4, not $44, 4 4 There's not much impetus to be a fur trapper. There's some animal damage control trappers because the people in the city going, this coon is getting my trash. Come get him out of my yard. Yeah. yeah. But as far as the landscape, trapping is a dead or dying art, unfortunately. Predator numbers are really high. The habitat's really fragmented. It's easy for a turkey to find a coon nest or a coon to find a turkey nest. I think the old boy from Alabama hit the nail on the head. We're not living on the land. We're not protecting chickens. I recently watched with my children, who are in college now, one of them is, an Andy Griffith show. I mean, you know, like the best show ever in America, right? <laughs> and in this episode, I won't go through the whole thing, but a prisoner that Andy put in jail, had got out and reformed, and he comes to town, and Barney's all scared, but the guy really just want to give Andy a thank you. Hey, man, you really turned my life around. I appreciate it. And as a gift, I'm going to give you this shotgun. And Andy says, man, that's great. This is perfect for killing chicken hawks. Now, if that show would have been published today, <laughs> yeah. it would have been a law. There would have been many groups suing the producer of that show. Yeah. But that was just common talk back then. I'm going to protect my, this was a prime time show, folks. A prime time show, one of the most popular shows ever in America. I'm going to protect my chickens. Yeah. And I'm going to take a predator off the landscape. If you said that now, my gosh, you, I would be sued. I'll, I'll probably get sued off this podcast. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I'm not saying we got to kill hawks. Please don't email me that. I'm not saying that. But we got to get some cover and we got to reduce the coons and possums. If we want to have more of these ground, and it's not just turkeys, folks. That's a big obvious one we hunters see. There's about 27 species of songbirds that nest zero to five feet off the ground. They're all up in arms because the South Americans are cutting rainforest down, and there's no place for them to winter. Have we thought about our lack of responsibility and letting the predators be out of balance with prey, and these coons are wiping out these little songbird nests zero to five feet off the ground? Have we thought about that at all? Are we accepting our responsibility in the decline of many birds that are ground nesters or low nesters. And I say, no, we have not accepted that responsibility. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've preached enough. Okay. I got, I told you I wasn't going to keep you this long, but I got one last thing I got to ask you about because I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on it. Um, Alabama just passed a baiting law. Georgia did recently. And um, I know, I know as a whole, it's, it's better to not be baiting. Um, so I'm interested in your thoughts on that, but specifically, what about the guy who's got 40 acres and he's surrounded by guys with 40 acres and they're all using corn, uh, as bait? What would you suggest for that guy to do? So maybe your, your kind of overall thoughts first and then that situation. Gosh almighty, this is a no win situation. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really trying to get you a lot of letters after this podcast episode. I know it. <laughs> I, I'm just, can I just announce that I'm ignoring social media for two weeks after this yeah. podcast? <laughs> um, you know, my heart goes out to the 40 acre guy that's trying to do it right, and all of his neighbors are putting corn on the ground because turkeys and deer are cornaholics. There's no doubt about that. My good word for the 40 acre guy is. Based on a lot of science, my friend, in Georgia, someone was doing a study before the southern zone legalized baiting years ago. The northern zone just legalized it. The southern zone legalized baiting. There was some big-time studies going on on the deer harvest per unit effort. How many deer were harvested out of X hours of hunting? And then they allowed baiting. And as you would expect, the first year, 
it jumped up. More deer were killed per hour. And every year after, it went down. Because deer get conditioned to feeders, and knowing that hunters are by feeders usually, and so they, the more mature deer use them at night. Now everyone says that everyone says instantly. What about Texas? I see Texas. Well, you don't own twenty thousand acres and have four hunters hunting it. You're not Texas, <laughs> Alabama. You're not Texas. So get over it. You're not <laughs> Texas. I hunt South Texas, and it's a miracle. I may see a hundred different bucks a day. I see a hundred bucks every ten years in South Alabama. So you're not Texas. The laws are not the same. The land ownership patterns are drastically different. In South Alabama. Uh, or Georgia, or Michigan, or these other eastern states, baiting could be more effective if it wasn't so widespread. But when everyone baits and hunts right over their corn pile or beet pile or carrot pile or whatever pile they got out there, you really do a great job of conditioning deer to avoid feeders, where there's a bunch of human scent and battery scent and plastic scent and every other scent, and only using them at night, like Pavlov's dog, exactly like Pavlov's dog. You know, he fed the dog a steak every day for 60 days and conditioned it the 61st day. He didn't feed him steak, and they bit the hell out of him. Excuse me. No, they just bit him because, you know, no, no. He showed that they salivated. They were conditioned. Same thing with deer, except it's negative conditioning. I'm going to feed you, and then I'm going to sit right here with my 30 out 6 and kill you when you come to the feeder. Now, if you have enough discipline to feed and only rarely hunt, it's a very effective technique, but the data is clear that most people do not do that, and it reduces the amount of kill per hunter unit effort. So to the 40-acre guy, your hunting probably got better. The deer are going to spend a majority of the nighttime hours on your neighbor's property, and the first week of season, your neighbor's going to kill some deer. After that, they're going to be really nocturnal, and if I was you, I would have some really good food plots and have a great season. Hmm. Wasn't it South Carolina that had a study several years back that showed that when deer have, you know, feed can get corn from feeders, they actually move less because they don't need to browse. They just basically fill up South with the Carolina, feeder. My, my, good friend, my good friend, the state coordinator, is still the state coordinator of deer in South Carolina. Charles did that study, was involved in it. Still the same. And people are people. If, if they don't have it, they want it. So recently, South Carolina... Same thing. The low state allowed baiting. The upstate did not. They hmm. got the law changed. Now you can bait in the upstate, and the amount of deer killed per hour has decreased. State after state, the results are the same. Hmm. Everyone says, how can that be? It's so easy. You put feed out deer, come to it. Yes, until you start hunting it much. Now, folks, I trap turkeys for different state agencies. All right? In, in very few places, you're allowed to bait during turkey season. So it's an outstanding way to trap turkeys. They're not used to being pressured at the corn feeder. So we get them coming to corn, and we put the rocket net out there, and we can trap them. It is very effective. But if you hunt overfeed day after day, turkeys learn, goodness gracious. I don't know, but last time I went there, Fred got shot with a load of, you know, number sixes in the head. I'm not going there again. It's just pretty easy to understand how conditioning works. So that's a can of worms. I don't mind addressing it. But now we're letting human emotions dictate good science. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate you putting your thoughts out there and taking the time with it, man. I I could talk to you for another hour about all these other different questions I got, but I think I think we need to wrap it up. I really appreciate you touching on all these different things. I I think this is going to be a really great episode. I apologize for going down rabbit trails, and I hope your audience will understand. I'm just trying to share information. I, I want everyone to have a great time out there, deer hunting, save time, get some fresh venison. I, I'll say one last thing as I'm signing off. Most people know this. I am a kidney transplant patient. I had a transplant 26 years ago. And then last year, my 19-year-old daughter gave me a kidney. I do all my health care. I'm very healthy, except for a transplant. I do all my health care at the Mayo Clinic. And my dietitian, the dietitian that helps me at the Mayo Clinic, tells me wild game which takes a bite of this and a bite of that, a bite of this, a bite of that, no steroids, no hormones, is obviously and infinitely healthier than something standing in a feed yard. Mm -hmm. Folks, you got to remember, the last thing I'm telling you is food is medicine. If you put it in your mouth, it is medicine, either good medicine or bad medicine. Hunting is a way to be very healthy physically, 
food-wise for your family, and other ways. Uh, my family consumes turkey, fish, deer. That is the bulk of our diet, and I've been blessed with great health even as a transplant patient. Well, thanks so much. What, where, where can we look for you coming up or anything going on? I know you've got uh, growingdeer.tv. Is there anything else we should be keeping an eye out for? You know, man, we do a bunch of seminars, and we try to post those on our social media. Uh, I tend to take the summer off from seminars and those type of events and really work on habitat programs. And then starting about September, uh, gosh, I know I'm speaking uh, late August, September, just somewhere in America a lot till I get into the bulk of deer season. And then uh, about second week in January, I'm, I'm out giving seminars somewhere. So follow us on social media and hope I get to shake your hand somewhere soon. And you do have, you offer some seminars at, at your property. Do you have any of those coming up? We, you know, uh, we, we do, we allow, we try to limit to a hundred, usually it's 120, 150. It's tough for me to say no to people. <laughs> and we do that once a year, it's usually in the spring. We haven't set a date for the next one yet. Uh, man, they're really fun and really intense. I have some other speakers come in and guys that are be- way better hunters than I am. Rich, Dr. Richard Hale, um, is a, just a phenomenal hunter. I learn a lot from Richard every time he's here, and he's really great to share. And Clint Carey, the best trapper I know, comes every year and teaches us how to trap. And so, yeah, it's, it's a blast. We don't have any dates set. It's just a lot of fun. And I'm not sure my wife is going to let us do much more. There's a lot of liability to having a hunter yahoos like myself <laughs> running around here shooting bows and going up down hills and all these. It's, it's a lot of fun. I'll be at Bass Pro's. Uh, you know, I had big fall classic. I think I'll be in Springfield, Missouri this year. Not sure about that, but speaking, but we're in a lot of places and I love visiting with people. I always learn. They, they've got a little twist, of their technique or their food plot technique. I always learn from these conversations. So I welcome people just to come up and have a visit. And if somebody wants you to come out to their property, they can reach out to you on your website. Yeah. Just go to info at growing deer or to our website or, or whatever, uh, we, we travel a fair amount. I try to limit it to about 30 trips a year just because, again, I like to be at home. I like to work on my own deer and my own habitat. But, yeah, we go help people literally from New Zealand to Canada. And and, uh, and if it happens to be during turkey season, I'm probably a lot more available. If you've got really <laughs> yeah, good turkey. You have a lot of turkey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you got a lot of turkey, I'm probably a lot more available. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Grant. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I know this is. I know our listeners are going to as well. Mike, I appreciate the opportunity and look forward to working with you again soon. We're out down south.